Right, hello, um, my name is Caesar, and um, I made this song in support of uh, Bonds v Gannick, uh, Gardening Question Time. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Peace. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I be bored under the money tree. It's kind of a rapper, but really only give a off about the flowers growing next to me. Letters to celery, lessons in letters while letting the veg grow. Sunstorms hail blow, but still I'm here digging up potatoes in my big old brown coat. It's locked down, so all these harvests come in handy and it's healthy to be grafting on some ground that's really asking for tomatoes. I might smoke a mile, bro, while sprouting avocado. It really takes its time so slow. Yo, it really takes its time so slow. Practice my patience or space on the part the plants in the plot i'm raking all these leaves which biodegrade into good good soil hey yo soil where i choose to toil i don't support the wars for stolen oil temper boils i don't support having poison covering food and royals richer than everyone else or ceos who never loyal to no one but the door yeah. to no one but the door so i'm sticking to my home grown from sticky icky to chili zucchini and spinach i never won't no yeah man it's all about this allotment business, you get me? You got like 60 pounds for a whole year, man. And I'm like, I bring home these fat stacks of, 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 you know, kale and perpetual spinach and all that. Do you know what I mean? What do you know about organic food? You don't know nothing about that, man. And it, yo, honestly, bro, just try it, try it. Love, you know what I mean? support allotments bro the allotment act in whatever year it was was a very important act in the uk history uh, right up there with the ramblers act all right <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Veganic Gardeners Question Time. I'm Dan Graham and I'll be your host for this evening. In today's show, we hope to bring you some new ideas and inspiration. However big your garden or windowsill may be, we're here to help you grow. For those people that are new to uh, Veganic Gardening and Growing, Veganic is a combination of two words, vegan and organic. It's a guarantee that your food and plants have been grown in the organic way using only plant-based fertilizers, which encourage biodiversity. So no pesticides are necessary. We don't use any agricultural chemicals, no GMOs. We don't use any animal inputs such as fish, blood, bone, or manure. It's all green, clean, and good for the planet. In today's show, we've had a bundle of questions already sent in. So without further ado, um, I'm going to get straight on to introducing our panel. And I, th I wonder where Ellen Mary is. Hi, Ellen. How are you doing? Hi. I'm good, thank you. How are you? We can't. Oh, hi. I heard you. I'm okay. Yeah, nice to see you. Good. Where, where, where are you? Uh, I am in... I'm not meant to tell you where I am. <laughs> oh, you're in quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Are you are you back in the UK? And you're not allowed to tell us you're in quarantine. <laughs> okay, well, I won't tell anybody. Don't worry. <laughs> Just the world. Don't worry. Everyone watching. <laughs> no. Yeah, yes, people. I am. That's right. And I'm keeping away from everybody at the moment for another few days. Well, you have been in the states, haven't you? Yeah, for a really long time. But it's been really cool because I've learned tons about growing in southern states and actually met some really well-known people who work in permaculture here. So it's it's been an education. So did you encounter any veganic uh, 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 projects? Very few. And where I was um, in North Carolina, where I'm um, in Charlotte, very, very few. So I hope that I was helping to spread the word a little bit. Great, I'm sure. I'm sure you were. We saw all your posts, <laughs> um, so you were spreading the word here, and it was good to see all the nice photos. Thank so you. So great. Okay, okay, Ellen. Well, uh, let's see what else we got on our panel today. We've got. Um, I hope you're out of quarantine soon as well. <laughs> oh, no, 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 sorry, don't don't mention the Q Q word. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, and we've also got on today's panel. We've got Jenny. Hi, Jenny. How's it going? Hi. 
Hi, hi, Dan. Yes, I'm good, thank you. Hi. How are you? Or, 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 should, I, or, or should I say, how's it growing? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's good. We've, we've been weeding kale today. So, yeah, we've been very busy. Okay. So, have you had a good crop of kale? Yeah, we only planted it as well. We only planted it six weeks ago. We've had our first harvest of it today. So, yeah, that's always good. We did 40 bags for Liverpool. Wow, brilliant. So what else have you got growing? At the moment, we've got, um, we're doing mixed salad bags. We've been doing those for about 10 weeks now. And then we've, our first cucumber started last week. So yeah, no, it's a, it's an exciting. So uh, everything's growing really well. With keeping on top of the weeds is a hard thing when it's hot and then raining a lot. So yeah, but yeah, all good. I, I, I should just say to everybody that doesn't know, this is Jenny Hall, the um, veganic farmer. She runs Climate Friendly Foods and has written a number of books, including this one with Ian Tolhurst. Um, and so how's the box schemes going? Is it busier since the lockdown? I mean, we, we don't, we sell to another box scheme, but yes, the, the demand for box schemes has gone up. I mean, the, the box schemes have been worried about obviously taking on lots of new people in case they don't stick with it long term. But yeah, it's, it's been very positive for local food. Excellent, excellent. Okay, great. So let's get on to who else we got with us. Oh, we've got our very reliable um, Piers. Hi, Piers. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, good. Thanks. Piers, a uh, wildlife filmmaker, author of a number of books. He runs a film school, European film school. So if you want to learn about wildlife filming, Piers is your man. Um, so how's it growing in South West Pembrokeshire, isn't it? You're in Pembrokeshire. Pembrokeshire, that's right. Yeah, and like like Jenny, we've had, uh, you know, sun and rain recently, so everything's growing like crazy, and it's uh, nice to be eating lots from the plot now after the uh, after the you know the spring break, and uh, I'm, I'm celebrating now because tonight I've eaten the very first tomatoes of the year. Wow. From the greenhouse so we've got tomatoes cucumbers spring onions lettuce you know full full salad time so it's fantastic excellent and you get to walk on the beach as well Have yeah you the beach it's just 100 yards away yeah oh god <laughs> lucky you lucky you great okay nice to see you again Piers. um and um let's see we've got off. We'll get straight on with the first questions. We've got quite a few questions this evening. Um, so we've got Rutter and Josh. Hey, Hello. guys, how are you doing? <laughs> All right. Great. Okay, so um, I said I'll get the rest of the panel on the screen. Um, here we go. And we can all be, yes, who else do we need? Oh, we need peers. There we go. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we've got uh, Rutta and Josh. Would you like to get, uh, let everyone know what your question is, please? So, um, we have a bit of a disaster year this year in our um, allotment. So we planted so many uh, different plants, courgettes and beans, lettuce. We don't have any, anything. Only potatoes. Only potatoes. <laughs> was growing and uh, so we 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 were, weren't sure what's happening to all the plants because uh, um, it's uh, obviously some some someone's eating them and it's only they they uh, cut out the leaves and then they yeah, just yeah. leave the stalks and uh, like with the with the runa beans we um, We've been planted like three times. We we um, we bought like very nice organic seeds and we've been racing at home. And uh, it's just overnight it's gone. It just like stalks left. And then we, one night we came with a uh, with the lights to, to inspect to see what's like what's happening. And we saw this. Uh, um, Insect, very <laughs> scary. Yeah, I think I've got a picture of it somewhere. Um, let's have a look. Uh, da, 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 da. 
Is this the insect? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a... Very scary. Gee whiz, what is that? It looks massive. It looks like a spaceship. <laughs> what could it be? Then somebody somebody told us it's um, called an airwig. An airwig? Airwig. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's called an airwig. <laughs> Sorry. So we don't know uh, what to do, uh, how to <laughs> protect our plant. How to get rid of the airwig. <laughs> right, well, guys, can you help uh, Josh and Rutter? Uh, shall I take that down? Go for it, go for it, Jenny. Oh, so, the wrong button. So just... Just so you're aware, Rutter and Josh, I was quite surprised that earwigs would take out a crop. Um, they're generally sort of omnivores, so they, they're often like seen as good guys, you know, but, but they will obviously munch plants. And I wondered, is there, any po is there any possibility that slugs were there as well? Um, well, we, we've been picking slugs in, and yeah. we're moving to the park. But it's not like slug, it's just, it's very strange. Like, it's a shame that we're not in a garden so we could show. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Started with so, whole leaves, uh, like cutouts. So we thought, yeah, we, okay. we thought it's ants at first. And yeah. then it's just, okay. yeah, cut, cut straight. So, 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 so to be honest with you, I had to look it up because I've never experienced that. Mm -hmm. And um, the sort of the you, you can sort of treat them like you do slugs. You know that you can sort of collect slugs and then, re like you just said, remove them. We can do the same with earwigs. So if you have an upturned uh, plant pot and then you stuff straw into it, then hopefully you can collect them and then remove them. I suspect actually there's a habitat issue, you know, that there's a lot of habitat there for things that can munch up your plants. Is it in full sun, your plot? Yeah. Or is it in a sort of, it is in full sun. Is, is there lots of nooks and crannies there? Nooks, holes, nooks and crannies. And it, that yeah. Lots, lots yeah. of little spaces. Yeah. Is, do you hoe regularly? Do you sort of hoe in between your plants? Is, or are you packing them quite tight? I mean, it's really hard It's really hard to say without actually having a, uh, having a look, and perhaps we could have a conf lab afterwards. But what I think is that the earwigs might be doing some damage, but I think some slugs might be in, involved uh, within the process as well, you know, and slugs can wipe out crops overnight. Um, I think what you need to be doing is making sure that the spacings are wide, that there's lots of, like, basically, that, that there's not, there's, it, do, you, do you do no dig or do you actually dig? Do we dig? dig you yeah. dig. You dig. So you want to be making sure that that tilth in your soil is very fine so that the basically things don't like to travel over very fine tilth as well. But earwigs can also be good guys because, like, earwigs eat, for example, um, they'll eat things like aphids and that. So it's, it's, it's a tricky one without really seeing, seeing. But hopefully if you um, make sure you, your crops are sort of wider apart and perhaps plant a bit later, what, what sort of date were you planting? Well, we did we did uh, in the springtime, like everybody, everybody in that neighborhood uh, yeah. uh, okay. planted and every, everyone's uh, around like thriving. I thought maybe it's something wrong with the soil at first. And, okay. Uh, so, so some. It's where are you? you, you well. Yeah. Well, maybe one thing you could try is planting a bit later. So, for example, we don't plant any of our main crops out till June. You know, so that sounds really late, doesn't it? But actually, we're now harvesting stuff that we planted four weeks ago. So sometimes it's hitting the the, the period of the growing season. So maybe try that planting later. I know I'm sort of not giving major helpful things, but I think. Um, you know, it, it's it's tricky without seeing the situation. But I think it's removing the habitat, making sure that they can't climb over the soil, making sure they're widely spaced. You know, often people plant stuff far too close together, so and then the perhaps plant a bit later. The beans were like had plenty of space. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I don't. I don't know if that if, if, if Piers or Ellen's got anything to add. Um, well, I I can suggest. Uh, another way to reduce your earwig population, although I agree it could be a variety of, of pests that are attacking your plants, but, but 
But let's say you want to reduce the number of earwigs as well as the, the plant pot idea that Jenny suggested. You can get some um, either newspaper or cardboard, dampen it, and then make some uh, thin rolls out of it and just tied up with string or something like that. And just scatter these around the crops, leave them for a few days, and the, the earwigs will go into these rolls and will rest up in there. So every now and again, you can go and you can collect up these rolls and then take them to a woodland nearby or something and just tip all the earwigs out. So you're not killing them or anything, you're just moving them away from your plants. So that, that's just another way of collecting them. Yeah, I've never heard of that, Piers. That's a really good tip. <laughs> I, I, I agree, really. With, I'd be really surprised if it was earwigs munching that amount of plants. I mean, you're going to need a lot of earwigs to completely demolish crops like that. So it's, it's, it's probably a combination of a few different insects, slugs and snails as well. So I kind of agree with Jenny on, on that too. So it'd be interesting actually if you implement Piers' approach to see how many earwigs actually end up in those, you know, cardboard tubes. Um, then you'll really know if there's a, a lot of them or not. Because uh, slugs wouldn't climb because uh, um, uh, the beans were, were, were quite tall and it started like the holes from the top. So I don't think it's, it's, it's slugs. Slugs will climb, Ruta. You know, if they if they can go up a like if it's up, up a bamboo pole or something like that, slugs will slugs will just go wherever. You know, they're 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 pretty pretty um relentless things, a slug. So uh, you know, and they the horrors, they're absolute horrors. And also, you know, it's be it was very very dry, and then it went to being very very wet, and it's just yeah. like. As soon as it's wet and warm, it's like perfect time for slugs. You know, they're like having a party basically. So you know, it's <laughs> a, it's 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 a, it's a tricky thing. So it, you know, I think sometimes that the plants as well don't like being like if they're cold, if the soil's cold and damp, they sulk, and you know that's also times when they're more likely to get uh, sort of attacked by pests. Mm. Okay, guys. Um... In the uh, Veganic Question Time episode one, there was a discussion about slugs in that, and there's quite a lot of information about slugs. So if you go onto our website or onto YouTube and watch um, watch that, you'll get some really good information. Uh, we're going to have to say goodbye to uh, Ruster and Josh for now. So thanks for coming on the show. See you later, guys. Um, and let's get on to the next question. We can find it here on the computer. Da, 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 da. Oh, what's happened? Um, question. I think I've clicked the wrong button. Um, da, da, da. Technical hitch. <laughs> Technical hitch. Um, here we go. Let's try again. This one. Here we, oh, it's done it again. Um, God. Sorry about this, guys. We, in the meantime, we will go on to a live question. We have got Jay and Katia from um, Bradley Nook Farm. Jay is a, a very well-known uh, farmer. Jay and Katia, they, there was a film made about their farm called 73 Cows, and they sent their uh, cows to an animal sanctuary instead of sending, sending them to the slaughterhouse. And um, Jay and Katya have now become veganic farmers. Yeah. How are you doing, guys? Hi, Jay and Katya. Good to see you. Um, oh, dear. There we are. <laughs> how, how are you doing? Can you All right, me? thank you. How are you? How's life on the farm, Bradley Nook? um busy yeah. but um you know we're busy with other things at the yeah. moment and but we're working towards the veganic yeah. farming things are imminent that's all i can say yeah and and that's what my question is um we soon hope to be producing um large quantities of compost using wood chip um at first and possibly some old hay we've got um, what's the best way to make a, a base 
to um, accommodate the, the, the compost so we can turn it easily uh, in possibly two windrows. What, um, the earth is too wet uh, where we are and uh, concrete would seem to be the obvious uh, solution, but it, it seems a bit expensive and elaborate. Uh, is there an easy way to do it? Do you want me to take that down? Yeah, go for Shall it. Shall I take that down? Uh, yeah. I, I know, Jay, that I know, Jay, that you've mentioned about pallets as well, and I think yeah. pallets would be fine on a very sort of small scale. We use pallet. The idea of a pallet is that you have the air block underneath so that the the uh, compost isn't soaking up the basically the ground moisture. Mm -hmm. But I think you know if if you have access to concrete, often that is the sort of quickest way, particularly if you're turning the windrows, which you seem to yes. be suggesting that you would be. Um, that would make compost in the quickest way, and it would also mean that you would be essentially be performing the role of that air block underneath by the, the fact that you're turning it. Because um, mm -hmm. the, the 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 big problem really with with composting is that it gets too wet and so that that if you can control the dampness of it so the moisture needs to be like a sort of wrung out sponge it never really needs to be any wetter uh, than mm -hmm. that then you know the easiest way is probably with the control of the of the concrete if it was me personally I, I would go concrete because it's so mm -hmm. if, if if compost gets too wet it then becomes um like brandling you know the brandling worms come in and yes. you know it turns really in effect into wormery and it the, the problem with wormeries from a, a, a sort of organic perspective is that those um the tiger worms are not natural in the soil so if you put them onto top soil they actually die and so yes. it, by this way we're trying to not inc it, we're trying to not inc i mean sometimes these things happen by the way you know it's mm. not an exact science but but the, the, really we want a bacterial breakdown Compost will always be better if it's broken through a bacterial process. If it heats up, mm -hmm. it means that the it humifies the um, particularly anything that's quite uh, sort of very carbon rich, like something like straw, will will sort of go down into a black compost much quicker if it's been through a sort of thermal process as well. Mm -hmm. So does that does that help you, Jay? Yes, it does, and we we shall use um, Eco Plus concrete if we build a pad, so it won't have too great a. Um, a carbon footprint. Um, there's another uh, sort of compost question. I'm obsessed with it. Um, I've seen people saying that they can ferment compost instead of aerating it. Um, of course, the firm that promote this have their own special additive that they want you to buy. And they claim that if you um, cover the compost up and add this uh, starter compound, you lose a lot less uh, carbon to the atmosphere and you retain a lot more nutrients. It, it, it seems to be almost too good to be true. Have you heard of it? And would it be easier than regular turning or maybe of no use at all? I mean, I mean I'll mean, let other people answer this, but my I have no experience of that. I know Elliot Coleman in the States, he he covers his, uh, his heaps with, you know, the... Uh, the plastic that's um, also sort of got holes in it so it can breathe essentially. Yes. And it, uh -huh. it's more to stop, It's again, it's to stop the rainwater going into the heap. Um, yes. But it allows the air. I, 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 the thing is, all the things that make compost exist naturally <laughs> in the environment anyway. Yes. So in a way, exactly. I'd, I'd say to you, Jay, uh, save, save your money. Um, oh, I and, want, um, yeah, you, I wouldn't want to buy yeah, stuff. Mm. I, think, I think composting happens anyway it's, it's putting the uh, sort of correct uh, you know correct condition for that to happen mm. I, don't, I don't know if, if um, Piers or Mary Ellen want to add anything um, I, uh, I agree with that if you have the you know the right components in your compost then you've got everything that you need in order to create the, the correct environment for it to break to not get too wet and for it to be the perfect compost and I know that's quite difficult especially if you're on a larger scale as well because it can take time too but I've never used anything else apart from anything natural off you know where I garden and that's always worked fine I mean I don't garden on a really large scale like you guys do um, but I'm kind of with Jenny on that and I probably wouldn't spend your money on it. 
Yes, I think I think they were using animal manure. Actually, I wondered if if it was transferable to uh, mm. vegan compost. I suppose you could always try it on a small scale and and see what happened. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Just try it in smaller compost bins how, see how yeah. it works and, and go from there and I think of course buying any other product um you need to know where that's come from you know and yes, has I, I, I'd want of, to avoid that yes yeah yeah mm. so I, I know there's quite a lot of products out there that will say that they're organic and and or and, and you will look at the ingredients and and think that that's okay but actually there's a byproduct and so and so forth that's actually been you know comes from come from animals so you just have to be a bit careful on that but I mean start small and see if it works and and then let us know <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you yeah that, that's, that's, sorry sorry anybody else got anything to say with for that one no all right well th well thanks a lot Jay and Katia Great to see you both. Thank You're you. You're hidden behind the bond symbol. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> we hope to see you soon. Um, Thank you. And yeah, bye for now. Thank you. Okie dokie. So, yeah, I've, can, for some reason, some. Dan, can I just. Just, can, sorry, go on, Jenny. Dan, Dan can, I just, can I just say something uh, uh, about Jay and Katya? I mean, what they've done is an incredible thing because they've actually opened up a conversation in the livestock farming community. And that really cannot be an understated thing. It's something that, you know, I mean, Dan and I have been involved in the Vegan Organic Network for a very long time. But actually, it was a game changer when, the, uh, when they both got involved. And just how grateful we are to them, um, because they've, they've put themselves in a position, you know, where they are criticised within their own community and where they've sort of said, oh, no, there are alternatives. And, you know, I think one of the things, and we, but what we're finding now is other livestock farmers are able to say, OK, we want to change as well. And it wouldn't, if it wasn't for Jay and Katia, that really would not have happened. So we're just like immensely grateful to all the work that they do. Indeed. Well said, Jenny. Yeah, they have Katia and they're leading the way. Dairy farmers and beef yeah, farmers. Exactly. Send your cows to the sanctuary and grow veganic. That's how we <laughs> want to go. That's the message for the world. Then we'll have a nice world for us all to live in without all this pollution and slurry and stuff going into the seas, uh, going into the water systems and polluting us all. Okay, so the next question. For some reason, the question seems to have disappeared. I'll see if I can find it this time. Uh, had it all organized five minutes ago. <laughs> right, press this button. Come on, please. <laughs> oh, no, it's no wrong one. Let's try it again. Um, here we go. Share screen. Da, 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 da. Windows. Is it this one? Here we go. Oh, I don't know what's happened here. Anyhow, here we go. Um, we will have to use this one here. Da, 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 da. Hi, I would really like someone to tell me how they can tackle the aphid issue. My crops are getting destroyed by black and white fly. Help. Thanks, Olga from Reading. Da, 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 da. Are we all still there? Anyone got any ideas on that one? Yeah, I'm happy to give you some ideas on that one. The dreaded aphid situation. And I know that there's been so many more this year as well because of obviously the weather conditions. But I know this can be like it can be quite a difficult um, conversation to have with people about pests in the garden of any kind, really. But obviously with organic gardening, we don't. Uh, we don't harm or use any kind of animal products, but it's all about looking at it holistically. So aphids tend to go for plants that are in distress or, you know, not quite so happy. So it's all about thinking about the health of your plants. But also aphids have their place in the ecosystem, you know, so by, by creating a nice kind of biodiverse environment, you should, you probably will still get aphids and you have to kind of accept that some of your plants will probably be eaten by pests, including aphids. But if you create a lovely biodiverse environment, you'll find there's lots of predators as well and they will come along and, and nature will do its thing and you'll find there will be uh, less aphids on your crop. So that's things like ladybirds, of course, and um, lacewings, some beetles eat aphids too. 
Um, so actually, earlier on when Jenny was also talking about kind of the earwig population, that kind of thing, it's about spacing your plants, making sure there's enough air, making sure they have the right amount of water and light and your um, soil is healthy and you've looked at companion planting. You can have some sacrificial plants so you can uh, kind of allow pests to eat some, kind of share it with them. And I know that's really hard because believe me, when I see, um, I have some tomato plants that have are covered in aphids and I posted some photographs of them I've, and they are absolutely covered, but they're only on one or two of the plants and all the rest are absolutely perfect. And wonderful so I'm kind of just leaving nature to do its thing and I know that that's easier said when maybe you've got more plants but that that can happen as well kind of on smaller scale too so it's kind of all about keeping your plants healthy understanding that you know they aphids even have a place in your garden or on your plot too um, because they are food for other insects so keep your plants healthy keep the soil healthy Think about companion planting, marigolds, all those kind of things, intercrop, that that kind of thing, um, and crop rotation too, and kind of uh, see how it goes over kind of two or three years, see if that kind of improves. Now, if you've got a lot of aphids now and you do really want to get rid of them, I do know some people that just put um, some cardboard or paper underneath their plants and they just shake the plants and and the aphids will drop onto the paper and you can move them away um, but aphids are really delicate so you have to be really really careful if you do that um, but to me I generally let it be as you know as much as I can and just try to create a nice environment for all insects and then they kind of take care of themselves so that's my advice great, great. Um, here we go. Maybe you could uh, get some of the earwigs from Ruta, who was on earlier. There we see David, so get in touch with Ruta. <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. Okay, guys, let's let's rock on to the next question if I can find it. Um, where is it gone? Da 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 da. da. Gee whiz, I've never had this problem before. Um, here we are. Yeah. Is it too late to start growing from seed? What could I still grow from seed at this point? And there's a second question to this. If I make a nettle fertilizer, how often should I fertilize? How much is it ideal for all vegetables? Thanks, Liz Erber um so here we go guys who fancies taking that one on yeah I, I can kick off with that okay so, um as for sowing seeds i mean it's still june i know only for another four hours but uh you know we've, we've still got plenty of summer to go so there are lots of things that you can sow now um and really you're thinking of two things one is seeds that are relatively uh, quick growing that will maybe mature in a couple of months and others will be ones that you're sowing now for harvest later in the year either um, towards winter or even early next year but starting with the with the quick growing ones um lots of lots of fast growing salads like like lettuces uh you can easily get them going now. And um, other things like peas, French beans, kohlrabi. Um, just think in, in general of these faster growing crops and you'll, you'll easily get a crop from them um, in August. Um, also think about your oriental uh, greens like pak choy and Chinese cabbages. They're often sown in July and August, and they will grow pretty pretty quickly. So, um, uh, oh, beetroot as well, of course, that that, that grows pretty fast if, if you sow it now. So, with those crops that I've just mentioned, um, get get them in as soon as possible. Um, Oriental greens, as I say, you can even sow them in August. And then there are others like. Uh, spring onions and kale that you can still sow now and they will um, harvest later in the year. 
um, or turnips as well. And then um, you can think about things uh, like lamb's lettuce is another one, uh, which is often grown either at the start or at the end of the season rather than in the middle. So lamb's lettuce will give you a really, or corn salad, also known as, will give you a nice salad green over winter as well. Um, so that's for the seed sowing. We got the second question was about um, the nettle fertilizer, uh, which is something I um, I make every two weeks. So every, every two weeks, I have a bucket full that's finished fermenting that I start using on the crops, and I refill the bucket and set it off again. So every two weeks, I have a new um, new amount of it to use. And generally, uh, when I'm using it, I will dilute it one to 10 with water and uh, I will give the plants a good soak of it once a week. <laughs> and um, that seems to work pretty well. Just bear in mind that the nettle fertilizer is, is full of nitrogen. And so it's really good for plants that you want to see having a vigorous group, uh, growth. So it's often used um, early in the season but think of all those crops that you've you've you planted recently or that you're about to plant, like some of the ones that I've just mentioned, um, and you can give them the nettle feed now to to give them a good boost. Um, for others that are fruiting, like tomatoes now, for example, I would switch to a comfrey free feed, which is higher in potash and it's better for the fruiting plants. Or even try a a mix of nettle and comfrey together. Excellent. Thanks, Pierce. Um, anybody want to add anything to that? No, I think that's great. Yeah. I, I, I read something that reminded me of when to use nettle and comfrey the other day. So just like you said, it was nettle before the solstice and uh, comfrey afterwards. And then you know at which, at which point you should use each. So just a tip. Great. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Here we go. Next question. Let's have a look. I don't know if you can help me. Our local residence group planted 20 fruit trees in my local park in the autumn, but I haven't really thought about how much water they will, will need, particularly with the dry spring we had. I was getting concerned as the leaves seemed to be drying up, so I started taking two or three litre bottles with me when I walked the dog, but that doesn't go far. I have raised the issue. I have now been lent a 50 litre water barrel as I roll up there. The question is how much and how often? I don't want the trees to die, nor do I want to kill them by overwatering. The trees are all different and include different varieties of apple, pear and plum. Advice greatly appreciated, Lynn Bliss. Here we go, guys. Anybody got any ideas on that one? Jenny. I mean, I yeah, I've got, I mean, I thought about this and I wasn't really 100% sure whether those were in tubs or not. I'm presuming they're in, in the ground as opposed to in, a, in some form of container. I mean, my view is, is not to water. And um, the reason being, and I know, and actually some of our fruit trees looked a bit ropey in May as well, because of obviously because of the, the drought conditions. But the thing is, when you water, you don't really water deeply, you're only watering the surface. So you're actually then actually encouraging the uh, particularly perennials to have more surface roots. So actually, weirdly, you're sort of making them more vulnerable to drought, whereas if they have to actually go um, looking for the water, then they will. And I'd be interested to know that those probably like our trees have actually recovered um, now, obviously, because we've had a lot of uh, rain in June. So, and I think as well that the circumstances this May were very, very peculiar. I've never known it that dry in May. So I think my my general advice would be to sort of save yourself the hassle and sort of, um, you know, once, particularly once they're established, it, it won't, won't make a massive difference, you know, because the fruit trees have sort of, they've got a very, very extensive uh, deep rooting systems. One of the things that might help in the initial phases um, particularly often with 
through is that they do not like growing in grass. So grass will sort of basically rob from the the sort of the, the small the small roots of of any perennial. Actually, not just tree, not just fruit trees, but anything like black currants or that. So some form of mat around the bottom of the tree. Uh, we use plastic matting, but plastic matting wouldn't necessarily help in a in a sort of drought condition but there's other things that you can get um but some some sort of thick mat really that's, that's ensuring that grass isn't growing basically all around the drip line of the tree so that essentially the the roots have the best chance of getting to the moisture and um you know i think that is the best chance for a tree um and also say i, I, I just have this horror of a port like trying to drag up a 50 like on a nice dog walk and then trying to drag a a 50 litre uh, water which possibly wouldn't even make masses of difference at that so I hope that's helpful advice um, and it'd be interested if, if Piers and Ella and Mary sort of agree with that. Uh, yeah I do I mean what I did learn in um, in North Carolina over the last few months is obviously it's incredibly hot and almost all trees have a really thick layer of uh, wood chip mulch around the base and you never see anyone watering any of them and I'm sure some of them are different varieties but many of them are fruit trees you know and um, so yeah I, I probably wouldn't be watering them either so I agree with that. Yeah and the, and the other advantage of wood chip is obviously it's very fungal in its nature so it's encouraging that sort of symbiotic relationship with sort of a fungal bodies as well so that would also help with the sort of drought proof in the trees you know and so that's really interesting what you said about South Carolina as well that yeah. that was sort of tally as well yeah brilliant yeah. No, that's really yeah. good yeah I agree if, if you're going to water you need to uh, water deeply and uh, a really good soak it always frustrates me when you see people watering their garden and they just give it a little sprinkle around the surface and apart from the fact that it evaporates off uh, really quickly it encourages these these surface roots and you want the roots to be going straight down so um yeah if you're going to water do it do it deeply and and not so often great thanks guys well, let's go straight on to the next question let's hopefully it's going to appear with us here we go let's find it on my screen i recently moved from the scottish highlands to be with my great auntie who lives near Bidford in Devon. She has a south facing garden which has been neglected. Would it be possible to grow kiwis in her garden? And what other fruit trees or bushes would the panel recommend? Thanks from Michael. Here we go, guys. Who fancies having a shot of that one? I can kiwis. start with this. Okie dokie. So, uh, well, lucky you going to a south facing garden in Devon. That sounds like a grower's paradise. It's warm <laughs> and uh, Devon usually gets pretty good rainfall as well. So, yes, kiwis will grow. And um, it's, it's surprising how few people do grow kiwis in the UK. But a Devonshire south facing garden sounds perfect for them. Um, so they do like it sheltered and sunny. So the, the perfect place would be a uh, south facing wall or maybe against a shed that's facing the south or something like that. Um, they are pretty vigorous climbers, so you can grow them up over a pergola or some sort of similar structure like that, and uh, they, they should do pretty well. One thing to bear in mind is that not all varieties are self-fertilizing, so if you're only growing the one plant, then make sure you choose a self-pollinating um, variety. As for other fruit trees, well, um, again, if you've got a nice, protected, sheltered, south-facing position, then that's ideal for fruit trees like peaches, nectarines and apricots. Um, in other areas of the garden, you can grow all the usual fruit trees like apples, pears and cherries. And of course, Devon is famous for its apples um, and its cider. Um, and then in the slightly more <laughs> shady areas, for example, under some of these trees, um, you can grow uh, the berries and currants. And so we're, we're starting to head towards a forest garden way of doing things. So um, uh, yeah, good luck with that. Great, thank you, Piers. 
and a bit. Sorry, guys. I'm seeing to have experienced a few technical problems this evening. I, I apologise about that. Would anybody else like to um, add add to that? Um, the the only thing I would add to what Piers said is that the Agroforestry Research uh, Trust, who do sell trees as well, uh, I mean, Martin Crawford, who's written many books, uh, he's a really good source of information. So he will probably be able to recommend a good variety of kiwi, um, and particularly what Piers was saying around the self-fertile. So it probably would, or, or wherever you go, you don't have to go with him, but he he is, um, it, though he's not certified organic, he doesn't use any sort of pesticides or that, you know, he would be a good place uh, for some advice as well to make sure you get the right variety often with trees it is about it's all about variety and making sure you get that match great okay guys it looks like we're getting to that part of the time of the day where we're getting to the end of the show so the oh. next the next show will be be streaming soon so uh, i'd just like to say thanks a lot to all the panel um our next show is going to be on the 4th of august we are in fact doing a tour um, of Beganic Farms in the South, and we're going to be making a movie. So we're going to Tree of Life Beganics near Canterbury. We're going to Rufford Farm, Veganic Farm near Hastings, Tolhurst Organic, Shumay, The Natural Vegan Plot at the Last Chance Animal Sanctuary, Cheyenne, and Tony Martins in, in South Wales. So okay. we're, we're not doing any shows next month, unfortunately, but we will be on the road and hopefully be sending you stuff via social media. Um, yeah, so today's show was brought to you by the Vegan Organic Network, an educational charity, the only UK organisation solely dedicated to veganic farming and growing. As I said, we are an educational charity and do rely on donors and members. Please join up and get our full colour magazine, um, which has got some great articles in it. I think I'm sure Piers and Jenny and hopefully Ellen will be contributing to the next issue. Um, so... Yeah, thanks a lot for watching today's show. We have got an end screen here, if I can find it. Um, da, 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 da. Let's have a look. Share audio, application window, and is it there? No, it's not. <laughs> I don't believe this. Um, anyhow, I think we're just going to all have to say goodbye and leave the end screen. So thanks a lot to Jenny. Thanks a lot to Piers. Many thanks to Ellen Mary. Hope you all enjoyed the show. Thanks a lot for watching. Remember, sign up for our newsletter, free newsletter. You get that on our website, veganorganic.net. And see you soon. Enjoy the summer. End of lockdown soon. Go out, come <laughs> camping, get some sunshine, go to the seaside. Hopefully, Ellen Mary will be out of hibernation, which not, we're not supposed to be mentioning. So, um, okay, so, okay, guys, thanks a lot. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, thanks, Bye. Dan. Thank you, Dan, for organising. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody.